Hey, good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. It's Matthew Lumberjack, landlord. Super excited to be with you today. After a fantastic boot camp last night with my students, it was a blast. We went about two and a half hours uh, talking about projects, talking about insurance rates, uh, talking about buying, talking about rehab, talking about kitchen design, uh, talking about Section 8. We cover a lot of stuff in that boot camp, especially for two and a half hours. Uh, but excited to be here with you guys today. The things I want to talk about today, really, where I really wanted to start off, um, was the five things I refuse to waste money on. Um, I talk to hundreds, probably at this point, thousands of landlords. Um, and one of the interesting things is, is I always, you know, talk to them about their process and what they're doing and how they're doing it and what their experience is and all of that sort of stuff, right? And so what I find really interesting are there are some things that are kind of trending right now that I absolutely hate. Um, and so I think what's really interesting is I kind of wanted to take you guys through them kind of um, uh, best to worst, i.e. If, if, you know, if it's number five on my list, it's a bad thing, but it's not as bad as the first thing on my list. So we'll start at the top. Um, one of the things that I absolutely hate is appliance extended warranties absolutely hate them. It's wasted money. If you're buying a product that's going to fail in the first three to five years, that's a piece of garbage product. Why are people spending $150, $200, $250, right? On a $800 to $1,000 washer. If it's that bad and it breaks that often within those first few years, you're buying the wrong brand. This is why in my course, one of the segments literally is what products to buy. Guys, that's the point. I own 600 appliances, 600. I'm not in the appliance business. I shouldn't own 600, but I'm a landlord. And that means I own a ton, a ton of appliances. So I do my research. No, it's not consumer reports, but we have a whole process of how you evaluate appliances. We have a whole process that we talk about of, Here's brands to avoid. Here's brands that you want to do. The idea that, oh, this one's the best-selling brand, that means nothing. That means absolutely nothing. Take it from a guy who's worked in an industry where everybody's always looking for the niche and the saying that they can exploit. And by, it's actually, this is where the crash bros get it wrong. It's actually true, but it's not true. It's true in a manner of speaking. But one of the things that we always hear about is these extended warranties. Again, 150, 200, 250 bucks. The numbers are absolutely insane. So the first thing that I would not waste my money on if I'm buying appliances, which I bought 600 of, is extended warranties. They're a complete and total waste of money. The other thing that you can recognize too is like with water heaters, they are more accurate. The, the guys who figure out how long something is going to last on water heaters they are more accurate than anybody else. If the insurance business could ever be as good as those guys, and the insurance business is really good, but if the insurance business could be as good as those guys who figure out when water heaters expire, i.e. Eight, eight years and two months, they'd be the wealthiest companies in the world. So first thing is extended warranties. For me, that's a no. As always, you make your own decision. The next thing on my list is lawn care. Many, many people hire services. And when they hire these services, those are expensive services. Maybe you're getting a great price. Maybe you're not. Who knows? But the first thing you should be doing is like I talk about getting three quotes. I always get three quotes. And then I make sure that I'm telling people how big my account is. This is how many units I have. This is how many lawns you need to do. But I also have pictures of my lawns. This is one of the other things that I talk about in my course, how to document your units. If you know how to document your units, you're not redoing this work every single time you're trying to find a new vendor. A little smart, right? A little bit. But that's where we cover that in the course. So when it comes to lawn care, I can hire because guess what? You can find an 18 to 22-year-old college student that would be more than happy to do your lawns. And the only thing that you need to require them to do in my world is I get them, I make sure that they have insurance. That's it. I make sure that they have insurance. That's what I want to see. I want to see that they have some sort of insurance that covers them and if something breaks or get or, or needs to be taken care of. Now we've had a we've had a rock go through a window, such as life had happened. We paid a couple hundred bucks for it. But I'm not going to pay 60 bucks a lawn for a small little patch of grass when I can pay 22 bucks 
it pays for itself in one weekend. So I don't spend a ton of money on lawn care. I don't, but I do want to make sure it's done. I do want to make sure it's done to quality. And when you find that person, they're thrilled because for most of you, it's going to be a half a day's of work, maybe even just a day's worth of work. But if it's that little, that's something that a college kid can do on the weekend and they can make a lot more money doing that than they can doing other stuff, right? We used to pay basically $250 for the patch of lawns that we had. It came out to about 25 bucks an hour. 18, 19 year olds aren't making 25 bucks an hour, especially there's plenty of them that want to be outside, you know, that are like, yeah, sure. So I get to be outside and hang out and do that sort of stuff outside. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I I dig it. That's cool. So lawn care is not something where I have a $30,000, $40,000 lawn bill at the end of the year. It's in perspective. And it's most importantly is it's a low cost item for me. On snow plowing, I have to pay that because there's a lot more liability there. But on on lawn care, no, I'm not wasting a bunch of money on lawn care because, you know, this guy thinks that he's that much better of a, of a lawn guy than some 18 to 22 year old kid. Not going to spend that money. Next thing on the list in the top five, and this is in order. The next thing is style to my taste. This gets a lot of you. A lot of you new landlords are out there and you're like, no, 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 but I want it to be amazing. Okay. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I do too. I do too, but I'm not styling it to my taste. One of the things though, so one of the common mistakes that we see with new landlords is they style a unit to their taste. I used to see uh, um, landlords that would say, well, I want it to be you know, an amazing place and really give a different feel in every room and really make it unique. Dudes, it's not a bread and, bed and breakfast. That's not what this thing is. It's not a bed and breakfast. And so the, the key to it not being a bed and breakfast is that you're not curating an experience in every room. You're curating an overall experience in the unit. That's where you can go with a great palette. Some people like Mike Zuber, one rental at a time. What did he do? He actually paid a designer to come up with a template and that, that's what they went with. Me, I designed my own because I'm that good at it. That's something I offer in the course. I tell you all the paint colors we use. I tell you the products that we use. I tell you how we use them. I tell you timing on the projects. We cover all that stuff in my course. So, and I won't go into it here because it's literally an entire module, which would take about 45 minutes to teach. That's why it's in the course. So the idea is, is that when you're doing your style, when you're curating the experience, it's not about you. It's not about you. People are like, oh, like I walked into this apartment uh, a week and a half ago. And they're just like, oh, yeah, you know, it's really cool because, you know, we call this room, you know, uh, um, you know, we we call this room a uh, uh, the purple room and this room is the red room and this room is the blue room. Okay. Why? Well, we just thought it was kind of cool. Okay. Okay. The paint jobs are a fortune in those colors. You spent two gallons times 40 bucks, 50 bucks a gallon to paint this room purple. You realize what a huge pain in the ass it's going to be to change that color because it's a dark, dark purple, like Barney purple. Like it's a or plum purple. It's kind of between Barney and plum. Guys, this is not what we're doing. We're there to curate an experience, but we're not there to become the next best known international designer. It's not what we're there for. So when you spend that money styling to your own feelings and likes and dislikes, no. The other mistake that people make is, you know what else they look at? They look at design magazines. Sweet Lord, stop now. Don't do it. Listen, in some of these super high-end places, right? Do you really think that an apartment where I do business should look anything like an apartment on the water in Miami? No. No. Ever. Never. Ever. Ever. And this is a mistake that people make, is that some of them are... I'm going to curate this amazing experience, but it's in every single room and it's like a bed and breakfast. And I'm going to spend an absolute fortune in paint colors. Do you realize how difficult it is after that tenant leaves to touch that place up? 
you will spend twice as much money on your painter doing things that way. Major, major waste. Have a template, have it consistent, work within that template. It will absolutely blow your doors off. It'll be absolutely awesome in keeping your costs low and curing a great experience. All right, then the next thing with that is on the other side, on the designer side, again, do you think gold handles and blue doors and oh my word, no, absolutely not. That is not the way to do this and actually make any money. No, we are not here to win design awards. We are here to curate an amazing experience for our tenants. And guess what? In five years, it looks dated and everybody can go, yeah, that was a trend in, oh, in 17, 18, 19. Do you know how long I've been doing my color template? 15 years. My color template has been the same exact thing for 15 years. And you know what people always say? I love it. We had somebody yesterday say, oh, I just, I saw this unit. I thought it was yours. I love it. I love it. Your colors are perfect because I can always just add my splash of color. Absolutely. A, a different color couch, a different color chair, throw pillows, whatever it is, a painting on the wall. All of those things, we give them a canvas that allows them to add their own personality to it. This is a mistake that many landlords make in a place, again, I will not spend my money trying to be the next best designer of apartments. Next thing on the list, this one's near and dear to my heart. Far too many people are wasting time. And honestly, the message boards, guys, admittedly, you guys know me well enough. I'll be honest with you. I, I just can't cut it any other way. I, these message boards, the, uh, this is why I hate social media. These message boards, I'm glad, you know, the number of people that take advice from people that have no effing clue blows my mind. But that's why the Crash Bro channels are like 20 times larger than mine or even 50 times larger than mine. Because we're all here doing work. We're all here making money. We're all here figuring out the next thing. We're not on there getting our ears tickled. Oh yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> nope, we're not like that. Nope, I'm pretty sure it just became a meme. But we're not like that. We're here doing work. And so as we look at these scenarios where we are doing this work, right? Honestly, like the thing that, that this one is landlord insurance. The purpose of landlord insurance isn't insurance. It's basically insurance against you being a bad landlord. That's really what it is in my eyes. This is um, the tenant moves out, does a bunch of damage. And so you want insurance to cover your bad rent and the tenant, you know, and, and, the, and the repairs for when that tenant leaves. What are you, nuts? I have a better idea. Take my course and get a whole lot better at picking good tenants that don't trash your place. The con, listen, if they made a product around it, I can promise you they're making a ton of money off of it. They are making a ton of money off of landlord insurance. Now, I would never, me, in a million years buy landlord insurance. I wouldn't. Why? Because I'm bad at picking tenants? Because they're going to trash the place? Because I'm worried that they're not going to pay rent? Like, guys, that level of insurance is insanity. Do the numbers. If you're making six, seven, eight percent on your property, you're losing money now. Between landlord insurance and then adding in a PM, I don't understand how you guys evaluate single family deals and don't lose money on almost all of them. And when taxes and insurance rates and things like that start changing in the next two years, guys, those single family assets, a lot of them are going to be in trouble. Thankfully, you have 30 year fixed rate debt. But if the economy goes soft and rents flat and you're not seeing a five to seven or 9% increase like most people were modeling, those are the people that are going to be in the deepest trouble. But if you're on top of that paying for landlord insurance, guys, I promise you, the people that are buying that insurance are ones that haven't taken a course like mine to understand how to select a tenant properly. And so what are they doing? 
They're basically putting a Band-Aid on a future wound. That's what you're doing. Use insurance. This is how I use insurance. How I use insurance is to not legislate and block out the sun and anything that can possibly happen. I use it for catastrophic events. If a tornado happens, if an earthquake happens, if a hailstorm happens, um, you know, if there's a slip and fall, if there's some major thing that occurs like that, then yeah, I've got insurance and I've got really good insurance and I've got an umbrella on top of that. So if I have all of those things, why is it that I need to legislate out the opportunity or the possibility that I'm bad at selecting tenants? If you consistently put that policy on every single one, there's no way I see how you make money. I don't get it. I haven't said solar yet, Corby. I just saw it out of the corner of my eye. And solar is close. Solar wasn't in the top five. It was like literally like six or seven. These other things are smaller numbers. And so these are the things that I think people are more likely to do. Solar is a massive, massive investment. So that's a fantastic catch there, Corby. Um, and then lastly, this is the one, oh, this is the one that just gets my goat every single time. I don't want to be like the guy that I hate hustle porn. I hate it. Hate it. So I don't want to post this, but I really feel like I need to. What my day looks like. I hate hustle porn. I hate it more than anything because I'm not about talking about what I do. I'm about, I'm about, or what I'm planning to do. I talk about what I've done and that's it. And I'm not talking about what my process is in a lot of cases. That's a lot of the questions I get in boot camp, and I'm happy to share with those folks because I leave, you know, there's nothing left to the imagination in the boot camp. Um, but what I can tell you is the biggest mistake that most landlords make is paying retail paying retail. I'm not sure you guys are ready to hear this. I really am not. If you're paying retail, I, I, I'm, I feel bad with it even coming out of my mouth. You're lazy. You're lazy. And maybe that's the goal, Dion. Maybe that's the goal. But even Dion gets three quotes. Even Dion looks at the price of the things that they're putting in, whether it's windows or cabinets, he still looks at those things. So I got him being at least, at least a little bit less lazy, at least a little bit. And so this is the thing. These are the things that we need to look at. When you're looking at buying something for retail, listen, if you've already opened up an LLC, you should be, or a trust, either one of those guys, do you know why an EIN is the same number of digits as your SS? Same number of digits, I think. Pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Open up accounts. Open up an account with a lumberyard. Open up an account with the big box stores. Open up an account with an appliance place. And you can tell them, you're not looking for credit. You're looking to have a cash account. But you want to get a contractor account with them because you do property management. Even if you don't do third-party property management, that's okay. You can do property management just your own, but have it in a local yard. And then take advantage of that pricing. You should not be paying contractors to carry your debt. They don't want to carry your debt. That's how they got burned. That's how they get burned consistently by, by, by different companies. Is the company might pay them the check eventually, you know, for the materials that they bought. But then they're chasing them down for the labor money. There's nothing more stressful than owning your own small business and chasing people for money. That's how most small businesses go out of business. They're chasing people for money for the service that was rendered. So if you put yourself in a position to really be an operator, like I teach in my course, really be an operator, then what are you doing? Quite frankly, you're not doing any of these things. You're not doing appliance extended warranties. You're being a good operator and finding a less expensive way to take care of mundane, mundane things like lawn care. You are not styling to your own taste because you recognize not only on the front end is that more expensive and time consuming, but on the backside, more expensive, also more time consuming. 
you're not getting landlord insurance contracts because you have a skill on how to select good tenants. And if your PM doesn't have it, fire them. Fire them. True story. One of the biggest mistakes, I'm an executive, one of the biggest things executives, factually speaking, for a company, one of the biggest mistakes that executives makes make is not hiring fast. They take too long to hire great people, number one. And number two, firing faster. Hiring fast and firing faster. Fire faster. Don't be ashamed that you went through three PMs in nine months. Don't be ashamed. Tell them, I want to work with you. I want to give you a six-month period. I want to see how that works. I want to see what it's like to work with you. And if it's awesome, awesome. If it's not, bye. And I'm not signing a contract. And if they don't want to take that, then they need you to sign that contract because they might not be very good at what they do. Just that simple. Just that simple. So often, these are the mistakes that people make. And then the biggest one, like I said, is people paying retail. Drives me absolutely bonkers, people paying retail. Do you know that I went, so Home Depot, we'll use their name because I'm being kind here. They have a concept of something called a bid room. You have to be signed up as a contractor. Sure, yep. But they have the concept of a bid room. If you need to go do a project, now you can't do it for every little thing, but this is what will help better organize you so you're getting better pricing on the things that you know that you're going to need. You need to get more organized. That's what my course teaches, getting more organized in how you're doing projects. If you're getting more organized in how you're doing these projects, you can save money on not only the amount of time it takes the project to get done, but also in having all the materials that you need when you need them so your contractors are never waiting for materials. This is a major mistake that gets made. Major, major. We made the mistake of not ordering doors on a project because we were like, ah, we can get those in five to seven days. No big deal. We'll order, we'll order them the week before. Guess what? The factory had a shutdown. They had some problem with some of their major machines and those doors were now three weeks out. Guess what I had to do? I had to waste an entire month's worth of rent waiting for doors. Pissed me off. And it was something that was 100% avoidable. I promise you conversations were had. But that's the kind of stuff that chaps my ass because that was a completely avoidable mistake. Now, when we go through the project, we create the project plan, we're taking a lot of our measurements. We know how much base we need, how much trim we need, how many doors we need, the style doors. Again, that's a template. So we already know we're just getting the sizes of them. But these are the types of things when you're not having to pay retail, you don't pay retail. Do not pay retail. You can put them in the Home Depot bid room as an example. We were doing a major electrical upgrade. We shopped around three or four different places. We shopped both big box stores and then a couple of um, uh, smaller uh, electrical outfits. We went through that process with them. And we saw all the numbers and we said, oh, okay. And then we asked them, that's the volume. We always share with them the volume number, but we said, is there any, is there any work on, on price? Someone gave us a 3%, someone gave us a 4%. We went into the bid room, we got 21% off a majority of the things that we were ordering, 21% off. Guys, 21%. That's straight to the bottom line. That wasn't a $50,000 project either. That was like a I think it was about a $3,000 project, three or 4,000, what we were doing, three or four grand, 20% off. A penny saved is a penny earned. That's 600 to $800 I saved by being a better consumer. Now, tell me the course for a thousand bucks isn't worth it. That's one order, one project, one time. Guys, this is why people that are taking the course are like, it's the best investment I've ever made. I teach you how to buy. I teach you what to buy. I teach you how to go out and buy it. This is the stuff that you guys need to become elite. There is no doubt in my mind. If you're already doing all of the things I just mentioned, then my course will probably not help you in that area. 
it'll probably help you in advertising. It'll help you in how to talk to code enforcement. But this is the stuff that makes me so passionate. There are a ton of courses out there on how to buy real estate. I have certain favorites and I have others that I don't like at all because I've seen and talked to a lot of the creators of them. But I can tell you, managing your assets, how to grow your business and how to properly become an operator on the daily so then you can have a bunch of your life back and get a bunch of value add after you've done a project. This is how it's done, guys. This is how you get from living paycheck to paycheck, just like I was. I almost went bankrupt three times. Three times. But I figured out the process and I figured out how it worked. And that's what we talk about in our course. So hopefully that was helpful to you guys. I know I get really amped up about this stuff. Ooh, I get really amped up about this stuff. Course boot camp was awesome last night. I always have so much fun with that. And literally because I go for two and a half hours on that, but all the conversations and all the different situations, we had somebody new in the class last night. Shout out to you. It was great to have you. We had somebody new in the class last night. And I said, hey, was last night helpful? I really, truly want to know. Responds back. He goes, oh, my word. He goes, the amount of stuff that you guys covered and to the depth that you covered it was amazing. He goes, this, that was awesome. He goes, I, this is, I'm so glad I did this. Love that. Love that. Love having you there. All right, let's jump in. Let's say, holy cow, you guys are blowing me up with comments. I love it. Angel, good morning. Mike Diaz, good morning. Hi there. What's up? From the laptop. Um, Mike Diaz has a question about insulation ductwork. I promise I'll get to it. Mandy W., good morning. Angel, hi. And is that a fish? I don't drink. <laughs> Hit that like button on your way in. Thanks, Hyder. Invest. Hello, every morning. Good morning, Chester Wealth Building Journey. G Lover. I know it's Glover, but I still like G Lover. That's always how I heard it in my head, anyway. Uh, Laura Samanigo, good morning. JLD Systems, good morning. Frank, good morning. Jordan Harmon, good morning. Ohio Real Estate, Matt's Landlord course is fantastic. I refer to the material often. The unit documentation part changed my life. Thank you so much for saying that. Guys, this isn't BS. This is a game changer of how you manage your assets. There is no doubt in my mind it's a game changer. No doubt. I can tell you, how else do you think I can manage 137 units and have a full-time job and still do active projects? How do you think I do it? I mean, aside from being absolutely amazing and elite, I have processes and systems in place that drastically reduce the amount of work that I have to do. It's the only way you can do it. Um, Josh Burdick, glad you enjoyed Matatui. Yeah, thanks for that. If you guys haven't seen it, uh, I think it's in the One Rental at a Time group if you're in there. Um, I'll, I'll actually repost. You know what? Now that I think about it, I'll repost it. Um, Josh Burdick basically put my face on Ratatouille's body when I talked about the Section 8 tenant that had a rat, that created a rat problem. It was really funny. Uh, Jordan Harmon, Lumberjack, have you ever done Airbnb? I'm doing my first. I'm going to try my first one. I'm going to try my first one. I have a super unique property where I'm just like, yeah. And so we're talking through a different couple of management people because I want nothing to do with it. So we're talking through a couple of management people. We're just going to kind of see how it goes. But I'm going to try one just for the hell of it, just for the experience. If I don't make any money doing it, it's fine. Uh, meaning make any more money than I would have if I just left it as a, a, a short, a long-term rental. So we're going to try it and see how it goes. Um, it'll be, um, it might be night to night, but it might be midterm rental as well. We're kind of feeling that out. Um, but I have just one one asset that it's like the perfect use of it. And so we're going to give that a shot. Uh, Richard Gamino, great morning. I agree. Laura Samaniego, appliances, perfect time. On my way to HD, I bought a GE dryer for a rental property, not mine a week ago, and it's not working already. See, now that's the thing. That is something that it should be under warranty as it is. You make the phone call. You shouldn't have to go to Home Depot. But you make the phone call on the warranty line and tell them what and tell them what the issue is they will get somebody out there for warranty work. My point is, is that if you're buying warranties to take you to three, four, and five years, well, then you're buying a piece of crap. If it's not still working in three, four, and five years with just normal general care, then you've got a problem. Then you've got a problem that you bought a lemon, basically. Um, let's see. Julie Anderson, I style my unit next level. Yep, classic, not trendy, uh, neutral and simple. Those are, those are winning combinations, Julie. You know that because you have great renters and, and you have you know low turnover. Classic, can, think canvas. You know, think I want to give them things where all they have to do is come in and add their personality. 
Maybe it's a painting. Maybe it's a picture. Maybe it's a colored couch. Maybe it's throw pillows. Let the trendy be what the tenant is adding to the equation, not what you are adding to the equation, because then you're going to be in charge of keeping up with the trend. Angel R, had to refresh the live. Matt, wasn't loading. All good now. Thank God. I think we beat the gremlins, found out that it was a lightning strike on what's called an amplifier on a pole about three streets away from where I, where my studio is, uh, which is in my house. Um, but I think that that's, but the lightning striking that amplifier is what kind of blew out where it became spotty and then it was like working its way through the system. So he swapped that out, swapped out a couple of lines at my place and we've been good to go since. Uh, BF, happy Sunday, Lumberjack. Happy Sunday, BF. Um, all nighter. I'm sorry I read that, Laura. Home defecto strikes again. <laughs> There are differences sometimes in the products that get made for Home Depot and Lowe's than there are the ones that come to the small box stores sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. The way to tell is you look at the actual digits on the model. And if there's difference between the two, there's a difference in the model. Me personally, I like my local appliance store for two reasons. One, I want to support my local businesses. I'm a local business. They're a local business. I want to support needs. OK, second thing is, is it's a conversation when there's a problem. It's not some no offense to those of us who have kids that are that age, some you know 19 year old dipstick who's like, well, no, that's not all policy. Yeah, I get what your policy is. Do you understand the concept of an appliance not working within nine days of it being delivered? Do you understand the concept? I shouldn't have to pay for something that I bought nine days ago for a thousand plus dollars. And now I'm here having to talk to you about fixing it. I shouldn't be here right now. Can we agree on that? That relationship I have with the appliance vendors is really kind of twofold. Yes, I'm supporting. So point one, supporting the local business. Two, everything becomes a conversation. But the twofold part becomes not only do they take care of that warranty stuff and bird dogging that with the warranty company in many cases, you know what they also do? They use common sense. They're smart. They recognize you're a customer that you're going to be back for a whole lot more. And so you know what they do? In many cases, they service you. They service you. Do you think Lowe's has an appliance service department that's owned by Lowe's? They don't even own a long delivery department. They outsource deliveries. So I get to work with an appliance company that when I buy those appliances, I have a couple of other appliance guys that I use because they might not be readily available to me, but in many cases, they are. And then they can service what they sell. When you're talking to a company that services what they sell, are they A, more likely to recommend product that doesn't break or B, recommend product that breaks. Think about the disconnection that you have in many big box stores. Once that thing's out the door, IDGAF. But if it's a small appliance store, we I know the owner and I know the two salespeople and I know two of the service people. Guys, this is a relational business. It's not running spreadsheets. I can pick up the phone. Hey, George, how's it going? Good, Matt. Good. Yeah. Okay. I need a couple of things. Okay. Awesome. What do we have for a top vented microwave? You know, the four brands, five brands that we want to be looking at. What do you have in stock now that I can have my guy come grab? You know, and what do you, and it's the, the, it's reasonably priced. He's like, all right, let me take a look. Takes a look, says to me, this is the model. There's, here, there, I've got these three models. And they're all about the same size, cubic foot wise. Here's, you know, here's what you got. Perfect. I'll take that one. He's like, cool. I'll have it out back at the loading dock ready for you. Like, what are you going to get that anywhere else? No, no. The training that they put people through in these big box stores for, for appliances is, is absurd. It's absurd. They don't know the track record. They don't know the history of these brands. You know, they don't know that, oh, yeah, well, that thing's getting hit all the time with repairs. There are three brands that my guys won't even sell. 
my appliance guys. They won't even sell three brands. Yeah. And why? Because they break all the time. They don't want to grow a service business. Their services are really about customer enablement, getting the tenant taken, getting the owner slash tenant taken care of so they can be on their way back to living life with clean clothes, not smelling. <laughs> um, Angel R, pure fire. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. Landlord Odyssey, what's going on, guys? Great to catch you live. Haven't missed one. No, it's true. Landlord Odyssey, you're always here. All nighter. Um, but yeah, Dion talk financial free. What's up, buddy? Good to see you. It was so fun visiting with Dion. It was just, we had so much fun. We did something every single day. I kind of wish he lived closer, <laughs> but it was good. Came out for like four or five days. We got to hang out, I think, every single day except for one. Um, and it was because that was the day that I knew I had to be um, in Boston doing business. Um, yeah, so good. Every time, uh, uh, every time you hit, uh, every time you hit the out on a angel gets its wings. I think you mean like. But yeah, sixty three concurrent users and only twenty four likes. Guys, this is way better than that. And you're better than that. Um, Keith Hager, nice, neutral, soft color. And that does not mean start using yellows and creams. That is not that. That is not that. It's not that. I'm waiting for my eyes to go later on in life to where I think that might be an actually pretty color. No. No. Nope. Still no. Nope. Um, Aloha from Hawaii. Hello, Mark. I'm glad you're doing well. I'm glad you're safe. Uh, Lars Nielsen, watching as I am walking around in Iceland. I love coming here and listening. Well, that's like a cool mic drop moment. Excited to have you in the course, Lars. I'm glad you're enjoying your time there in Iceland. Uh, Aria Cerners, good morning, all. Good morning. Uh, there was the comment. Has Matt talked about solar yet? Solar came out just out of the top five only because it's so expensive. Most people aren't considering solar on their asset because the price is ridiculous. I have yet to run the numbers on an investment property where the cost of solar paid off in less than 17 years. 17 years. That basically means it's like a 6% return on your money. No, thank you. No, thank you. Not when I can spend my money and get a 25 to 30% return. Yeah, at that point, I'm leaving 20 points behind, right? Um, good morning, Lumberjack. From Sam Farho, good morning. Uh, people watching the show, please listen to Matt. He's giving years and years of this experience that will save you tons of money. Thanks, BF. I agree. Except the only thing I disagree with was it was one bag of money. It, we all know that it's many bags of money. Been there, done it, guys. Been there and done it. This is the stuff that saves you an absolute buttload of money because this is where I talk about acquisition. Yep, tons of courses out there understanding how to do acquisition. Stabilization. Plenty of courses out there generally talking about stabilization. Optimization? Nope. Nope. No one touches that stuff. Optimization is hard, but it's squeezing the last bit of money out of that asset that you can. So then guess what happens? When you go to sell it, you're going to get more than everybody else because it's fully optimized. When you go to refinance it, you're going to get more than everybody else because it's fully optimized. When you go and talk to a bank on getting some sort of a product against it, whether it's a HELOC or you want to do like a cash out refi, you're going to get more money against it because it's optimized. People that don't optimize their portfolios are capping the rate of which they can have success. And the, the rate of return is really what's being talked about there. My portfolio lives in the 20s for return on capital. I have assets that are returning 70% on capital because that was everything going according to plan, right? That was buying it right. That was rehabbing it right. That was better understanding via the rent box, the market for rents and what level I should try to get to. That was a value-added asset. Those are value-added assets. You're not getting anything turnkey with double digits. You're just not. And that's where I want to live. Would I rather have 10 assets returning me 6% or five assets returning me 12%? I'll take the five. Why? Because the next one I'm going to go acquire is going to be a 12, not a six. And if I need to sell or if I need to do a rehab, the higher the margin on your properties, the more and better you can sleep at night because a hot water heater doesn't take out your entire year's profit. 
as an example. Ironwood Workman. Hello, everyone. Hello, Lumberjack. Sam Farho. Uh, for owner-occupied, you get home insurance, and for rentals, you get landlord insurance. Note, you get fire insurance. If, if not landlord insurance, what do you buy to insure your rentals? It's almost the same cost for both. No, landlord insurance is above and beyond the fire insurance that you would get. There's policies that they write that cover tenant damage. They cover tenants not paying rent. It's really basically saying, I'm a bad landlord. I know that going in. And so I'm going to pay for a policy that's going to make up for all my mistakes because I don't know how to properly select a tenant. I don't know how to make repairs on a budget. That's what that one is. Landlord insurance is not a policy for insurance that you get as a landlord. That's usually called fire insurance. If you talk to most of your insurance companies, you can say investment property insurance. Likely they're going to talk to you about what's called a fire policy. And the reason they call it a fire policy is because often all it covers is if the house burns up, it doesn't cover any of the contents internal inside. It's usually what it is. Corby Carter, regular hard work is not something I call hustle porn. Yep. Similar. Yes. But the intent is not to impress others but in form. Yep. I'd love to see a day in the life. Honestly, I'm happy to do it. I'll do it. I'll show you exactly what happens. Well, not show you, but I'll, I'll document it. So um, yeah, let's do it tomorrow. I'll probably do it tomorrow. When I wake up, what I'm doing when I wake up, you know, um, and then right through the day as, as I'm, as I'm doing my work day, um, work days. I mean, I guess I could do a Saturday probably better. I don't know. I'll try it tomorrow. Cause tomorrow I know from like, 8 30 to or 8 a.m to 5 or 5 30 i'm gonna be normal day job uh even dion <laughs> yes uh wealth building journey it is yep format yep exactly but it's the same number of digits so the issue is is that format wise when you fill out that document you can put that in there and it can be uh an ein from a trust it can be an ein from a business or it can be your social as you're personally guaranteeing it. But if it's an in uh, an uh, um, entity's name, you can still sign up. I signed up for Home Depot Pro Rewards, not having a trust, not having a business, just using my own SSN with a, um, with, you know, basically a, a how we're doing business. Not a DBA. Dion, are you in Thailand? He is not. We just talked about his Thailand trip, actually. Um, dishes every day. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Dishes. Um, let's see. Incidentally, Simon's been on fire recently. The, the uneducated economists. Again, if you guys don't watch economic stuff, you should. You don't have to live there, but you do have to generally know what's going on and understanding some people's perspectives that sit in our seats, like Simon does, goes to work every single day, just like we do. He does. And he's in part of the industry where he can see where things are starting to go sideways. Price increases on lumber in the future, right? Three months, six months out uh, because of uh, mill curtailments and things like that. Like he saved me a bunch of money on building a bunch of decks because he was like, yeah, we're starting to see that he's like, the prices can't stay here. And sure enough, they didn't. $13, $13 for a two by four, $13. Now, $3. Those are real numbers. Legit. Um, let's see. Matt Bidner, it's better to make your rental into a Toyota, not a Lamborghini. Yes. Drive the Lamborghini. Don't make your units those. Uh, in fact, if you make your unit like a Toyota, you will drive a Lamborghini. If you make your Lamborghini, if you make your unit like a, if you make your unit like a Lamborghini, you will drive a Toyota. I'll still drive something economical, even though I get a Lamborghini. Um, the devil's in the details, three second summary, absolutely wealth building journey. And I think it's really an understanding of the other elements of where that devil in that specific detail is, because there's a thousand details, you know, there's a thousand details. The issue is, is that what one matters to you right then? And where is that? Is it a mindset change? Is it a process change that you need to make to optimize your portfolio? All night or higher. My small biz doesn't chase invoices. I only work for good people, but there's a limit of good people. True story. And that becomes the challenge. That becomes the challenge. Uh, Sam Farho, I saw a house with three units, but water and electric are not separated. That's fine. Uh, it's not a duplex or a, tri a triplex, but seems like a modified house to three units. So built later, maybe. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, we have some properties where the heating and electric is shared. 
but we just build that into the number and we just do a little bit of analysis on um, you know, what we think usage is, but usage matters also based on tenant. If you have somebody that's on benefits, doesn't have a job and they're home 24 seven, their heat is gonna be as much as a place three times their size. 24 seven, they're in the unit using it. So when we just rented out one of our apartments, we found three, three of the four renters are business owners. <laughs> they're never home. They're never home. And that is shared utilities. Guess what? Shared utilities, it's gonna be pretty inexpensive for that building. Why? Because they're never home. They're never home. Josh Burdick, all these cold hard truths kind of hurt my feelings. I know, sorry. Now I need to rethink the mirrors on the ceilings. Yeah, I mean, personal preference, fine, fine. And I get it. Wanting to judge performance while performing. I understand, I understand. But likely probably not needed. Uh, Keith Hager, dependable vendors and contractors I have found over time. Yep, there's a fair negotiable price, but if you have dependability by your side, life and time will be great. That's exactly right. I don't always pick the cheapest guy on the list, but if it's three guys and all guys I've worked with before, then I can go with the cheapest price. If they're all brand new, then I want to, you know, I'm the, the cheap guy. If they're all in the same ballpark, I go with the one who I feel the best about. You know, that's never led me astray. If the guy's not getting back to me while he's trying to get my business, that might not be the best. It might mean they're busy on other jobs, but it also means they might, they might not be good at time management, timeliness. BF, why would anyone use a PM? <laughs> they all suck and then they rip you off. They make more money than you as a property owner. BF, I agree. I agree. If we decide to launch a PM firm, it will be the best in the country, period in the story, because we have all the systems, we have all the process, we know how to do this stuff. And we, if we just do what we're really good at, we'll save the customer a ton of money. However, no matter how good we are, we're still going to be taking a, a big enough chunk where they will have to own more properties to retire than they would if they just learned how to manage them themselves in the course and understand how to insource everything. That's what we talk about. We talk about property management insourcing. We don't have third-party property managers. What we have is all the pieces that make up a phenomenal property management team, and I'm the quarterback. Uh, Laura Samaniego, uh, this is not my plan for Sunday morning, but listening to the Lumberjack live chats make it less annoying. <laughs> I appreciate that, Laura. Uh, we got some great people in here. I would not hesitate to work for. Absolutely. Absolutely fantastic people. Yep. Uh, lighter from dishes. All right. I don't ask friends for discounts because that's not a true friend. A true friend pays full price to help you grow your business. So you can understand, I don't mind working a price with somebody, but you're giving them work and that's important to them because when times are tough, contractors aren't always going to be three to six months out. They just aren't. They are. That's not how it works. I was around in 08, 9, 10, 11, 12 when everybody was looking for work. And you know what I did? All the guys who stuck with me, I made sure that they had as much work as I could give them. I did. I didn't squeeze them. I just said, nope, just want to make sure we can get it done. And so most of those vendors are still with me today. There's a couple that aren't. And I'm looking forward to the market correction and them calling me back again. Where's the best place to buy cabinet doors? Uh, I don't want to replace the cabinets, nor do I want to paint the doors because they are old style and made of compressed wood. Um, I don't know. No, not many places sell cabinet doors because it's a matter of the hinge and the frame um, then being able to match. And you're likely not going to get a great paint match color on them either. So you can have them made, you know, you can talk to, you know, some sort of like a lumber yard or something like that, or a, or a wood shop. And you can just say, Hey, this is what I want. I want it made out of, you know, half inch birch finished plywood so I can stain them and then just have them, you know, come up with some sort of a design where they can, you know, router the edges or whatever. Um, but there's no place that people just go buy cabinet doors. Not usually a thing. Um, Sam Farho, the show is electric today. Thank you, Sam. I agree. I told you, I promised it would be. Kev Boz. Oh man. Sorry, Kev Boz. Just lost my place. Do, 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 do. Oh, poo. And you guys are loading. Okay, there we go. I found it. Um, thanks for the idea, Matt. I didn't know screening was a possibility. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, screening is absolutely a possibility. 
Um, getting our hardwood floors screened in Kona today. Can't wait to see the difference. Dude, it's going to be awesome. Here's what you need to do. In your, on your Instagram account, you have a picture of the before, then show a picture of the after. Screening. It probably, it's a fraction of the price of sanding. Um, I'll post one today. I'll post a before and an after. Actually, tomorrow, because I got to get pictures of the after. Uh, Matt, what are your thoughts on working on an agent as a dual agent? My last deal I got by using this method. A method. I don't mind dual agents. I don't mind dual agents at all. No problem at all. Done it a number of times. So, yeah, no problem at all. Um, ba, 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 ba. Kev Boz, a penny saved has a greater than one cent after tax utility. Exactly right. 100% agree. 100% agree. What it does is it gets you in the behavior too. It's it's not only factually, you know, what you say is correct. It's a behavior. It's a behavior of you owning your business and operating it. I'm not just a business owner. I'm an operator. I'm an operator. And that's what people will see when they take the course that gets them to be an operator. That's the idea. That's the idea behind it. It's not just owning your business. Not just owning an asset, it's being an operator. It's operating your entire organization, right? My organization started off with one and then two and then three and then four and learning lessons along the way. Oh, if I had all the lessons that I've put in the course, if I had that 20 years ago, oh, my, it wouldn't have taken me 22 years to get where I am. It would have taken me five. It would have taken me five. It would have eliminated a lot of big mistakes. Um, Aria Stearns, wait, did Matt trim the beard? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He used to come down to here. It was right even with the lumberjack, and now it's here. Yep. Yep. I, I, I think it was like 70 inches. I trimmed off. Kids were getting me. Grabbing, <laughs> like hanging from it like I was a gorilla. Maybe. Less hairy, but gorilla, yes. Sandra Ortega, good morning from Fresno, California. Good morning, Sandra. Good to have you. Um, Angel R, Matt, considering offering 184 for a 250K property, 2,500 bucks in rent, needs 20K in repairs, has one Federal Pacific panel, okay, 5% down, 45K all in, 24K down plus 20K, cash flow 414 a month after expenses. Uh, depends on how it fits in with the rest of your portfolio, Angel. It really depends. Um, you know, 414 and you're going to be, what is it? Uh, 45K all in. So 414, so after expenses, you're 5,000 bucks on 45. So you're about 11% return. Seems like a good return. Seems like a good return. Um, yeah, seems like a good return. Federal Pacific panels are no joke. I just replaced 12 of them. Yeah, that was one of the, that was one of the electric, that was the electrical project I just did. I just replaced 12 Federal Pacific panels. Uh, Howard Wu. Hey, Matt, great boot camp last night. I agree. Can you talk through how you determine which wholesalers are good or bad to work with? So that's a great question. Um, great question, Howard. Great question. Always bring so much to the boot camp. Excited he's in there. Fantastic. Um, my experience with wholesalers is all about the deal. So I, you know, some of them are blustery and some of them are, you know, yeah, some of them are blustery a-holes. Uh, some of them are really quiet and they're, you know, always, you're always like waiting, like, hello, are we still on the phone? So it, it really, that that's what can cause. Um, so I, I have people that I like to buy from, but you know who my favorite wholesalers are? The ones that bring me the best deals. The ones that are realistic, the ones that are communicative, you know? So what I would talk about most with wholesalers is looking at the deal, understanding how they work and understanding how to put the, the deal together, you can only learn that about a wholesaler by going through the process with them. And so sadly, there's no like upfront, hey, fill out this sheet and tell us if you're going to suck or not. It's just like a tenant. It's it's tendencies, right? It's, okay, here's the deal. Call them up. Did they get back to me? If they got back to me, that's a good start. If they were on the phone trying to rush, rush me off, don't love that. But if they got me the information I need, very pointed questions, and okay, great. When can I see it? Oh, we're doing an open house on this date. Great. Is there any opportunity I can see it beforehand? Do you realize how many times I've jumped the line? I jump the line all the time, all the time. And for a guy of my size to jump anything is tremendous. But I jump the line all the time. And that's how I get into a lot of these deals first. 
So that's a great question. So really wholesalers, it's experiential. What's your personality type? How do you like to work with them? Do they get you information on a timely basis? Do they get you access on a timely basis? And are the deals that they're bringing you, you'll start to see consistently if they're a good wholesaler or not based on the margin that they have in these deals that they're bringing to you, or maybe that they're willing to work with you. Some guys price high out of the gate, but then they're like, hey, hey, if you can wrap it up in this time, I can do this on this. Okay, that's pretty cool. What you want to show them, right? The other question is what you want to show them, low barrier of entry, that you're easy to do business with, that you're ready to do business. You've got money, you've got pre-approval, uh, you've got contractors that you already know and that you use. These are the things, right? Because a wholesaler doesn't want to work with a retail. If they did that, they would have gotten the real estate agent license. They don't. Most wholesalers don't have their real estate licenses. They can actually do a transaction without having an RE license in most states. So that's that's my answer for how I work with wholesalers. I worked with a number of them. Some I like, some I don't. I always look at every deal though, because if the guy's a jerk, the only time that I DQ somebody is if they flat out lied on something. And I know that they lied, not feel like they lied, just know that they lied. So that's the best way to uncover it. It's relational. It's having those conversations. All right. Two super chats. Let me just roll down and see those couple super chats. Michael Diaz, insulation in the attic is scheduled. And I just realized the HVAC unit has a duct separate from the handler in the attic. Should I do the duct repair before the insulation or does it matter? Um, anytime somebody has to go in afterwards, my feeling Oh, my feeling, honestly, is I would handle that beforehand. Because if it's attic insulation, if it, are you doing blown in? Give me the follow up, Michael. Are you doing, um, are you doing the, um, oh, sorry. I'm looking for your answer. So give me an answer on um, if you're doing blow in insulation. Give me that answer first, and then I'll tell you what I would do. Millennial Mike, I'm going shirtless in this live just for you. I mean, between Dion playing the show me yours and I'll show you mine game and Millennial Mike, I mean, you guys got to see the post that he did this morning on Instagram. He posted him working out. Now he's always dropping knowledge. There's no argument there. Always dropping knowledge. I just have to go through the pain of watching him work out when he's dropping the knowledge. <laughs> that freaking guy. Love that dude. So crazy. Um, let's see. Keith Hager, part of networking on vendors is they are landlords. Yep. Plumber, heat and air, electrical, electrician. Um, I send them projects I find when I already have a project. Awesome. That's exactly right. Yeah, for sure. They, so there's not always those guys. I think in a lot of cases, you'd be hard pressed to find contractors that do that work on the side as well. Like our landlords on the side. You can, but that drastically limits your pool. And there are plenty of guys out there that are branching off of a new company. They're newer, but they've done it right for years. My trim guys are that. He left a big crew. They had like a big, huge, massive 30, 35 person crew. He went off, did his own thing, has a couple guys with them. And because they're working for themselves, they are super hard workers and they do great work. And so those guys, they don't own anything but they do great work. Now it's no doubt in my mind in five years, they will, but they don't right now. And so I like finding that guy who really had the impetus to, and the balls to go out there and do it himself. Recognize at the end of the day, the buck stops with him. Cause when you're a business owner, that's how it works. And those are the guys I like to work with. Ideally, sure. Some of them own property and that's all great, but ideally it's really finding the guys that do great work, decided to go off on their own because they wanted to make all the money. Now they get all the problems. But if they do really good at what they do and they're not the guys creating the issues at the job site, then that's a pretty good fit. Um, REI Stoners, the advertising is gold. Looking forward to listing our unit when the remodel is completed. That's awesome. REI Stoners is talking about how I advertise. I give you all the tricks and ticks, tips uh, and tricks uh, of how to advertise your units in a way that will get you far better quality tenants and a higher quantity to choose from. I appreciate you saying that. Thanks very much. Um, JMYC, Angel R, you getting a loan through FHA? Um, 7.69 is the loan. Okay, interesting. 
Lightning strike, Hyder says, we had a very little cell service in Alaska this season because an iceberg took out a phone line. I know, right? It's crazy. But infrastructure on some of this stuff is crazy. Hey, Robert Farinelli made it again. Fantastic. Uh, Landlord and course alumnus and soon to be owner of another new building. Congratulations. Joshua Coster, do you hold some of the uh, deposit for nail holes or small fixes to the walls? Yep. Because at the end of the day, if if the tenant wants to fill them, that's fine. If they want to fill those holes, that's fantastic. And they do a good job, awesome. I still got to repaint the wall. Now, at the end of the day, it's the same thing on a cleaning level, right? That's not normal wear and tear. You want to hang something on my walls, you got to make it right. And so the way that we literally do it is we don't care if they fill it and they leave us with all the holes filled with the little white specks. Okay, well, now we just have to roll the wall. That's fine. That's not a very, that's the other thing with being able to roll that wall because we have the same color template, we can actually take the paint that we have and just re-roll that wall. We don't have to cut it all in. So very often we can make that look really good just by fixing those few walls. And that might be a couple of hundred bucks. Same thing with cleaners. In some places we send cleaners into, guess what? It's $600. In other places, I just got one that was 90 bucks. So that guy that was 90 bucks, he, his family really cleaned. I'm happy to give them back the deposit. I think it's a pain in the ass for me to call up the cleaners. I don't want to do it. But very often there's that varying scale. One's 90 bucks. The other one's 600. Well, the 600 one didn't even clean out the fridge, didn't clean the toilet, didn't clean the tub, didn't clean the sink, didn't take stuff out of the cabinets. Like they just left a bunch of shit behind being lazy. Okay. All right. Well, then you clearly don't mind getting the bill now, do you? Um, All Nighter Hider, a uh, question. Do you ever look for models with cosmetic hits? Yep. That may not be seen, but come with a discount. Yes. So the parts that you can look at, that's a great question, Hider. You can look at the sides of the unit and the back of the unit. So if like the bottom corner's crunched or the side has a scrape, but you're fitting that fridge into a pocket, all sorts of that stuff. Heck, if it's expensive enough, there are sometimes because it's so expensive to send the entire appliance back. I showed you guys, you can look it up on my Instagram. I bought $12,000 worth of appliances for three grand. 12,000 for 3,000 bucks. One of them was a special order that they got tired of holding on to. But look at that Instagram post. It's on there. If you're not following me at Lumberjack Landlord, you should be following me. I got like 17,000 something followers on Instagram. But take a look at that. It'll blow your mind. I saved $9,000 on appliances that I'm going to use. There was a $4,000, I think, dollar fridge, and it had the bottom uh, freezer panel was dented with a, with a dent. I can buy that panel for 300 bucks. Save thousands on the fridge. Yeah, I'll buy that panel for 300 bucks, or I'll put it into a unit where they never would expect that they're going to get this big, beautiful stainless steel fridge. It's got a little dent on it. And we mark it down. We're like, hey, just so you know, we're, there's a dent there. We took a picture of it. It's in the file. So when we go to do a walkthrough, you're not going to get blamed for it. That's kind of the idea. Key, good morning, sir. Also an alumnus. Good to have you see, Good to have you here, Key. Buying some awesome property in the Bay. Um, Dion Talk, autocorrect got me. Looking forward to you proving how lazy you can be. <laughs> I told De- Dion, I said, I'm coming for you, buddy. After I retire... And after I finish all of my uh, rehab projects and all my optimization of my portfolio, we're probably a couple of years out. I told him, I said, I'm going to give you a run for your money. And I said, if you've still got 18 units and I've still got 140, um, then basically, or 130 and change, I'm basically seven times the size of your portfolio. So the question is, if you're spending three hours a month, I can spend 21. So now we'll see economy of scale. I'm really excited to do that just to just to have fun and talk to Dean about it. But that was one of the things we talk about all the time. Deep down on the inside, there's lazy in me. Deep down, it's there. But I just have to have everything done first. Um, Dion's just more done than I am. Uh, Robert Farinelli, uh, is it normal for a seller agent not to respond when you are under contract, trying to get some documents from the seller for my loan to go through? Seller agent. Yeah, it's 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 typical. It's typical. They're in the bucket of agents that I hate, but it's typical. It's typical. Yep. Um, are you working? Do you have a buyer? Do you have a, your own real estate agent as well? Then they, you should both be hammering them. Yeah. Every single day. Hey, where's it? I need this document. This is needed for the bank. This is going to delay it because then you have written proof and documentation that they were the holdup. Now, the 
seller themselves might be the actual holdup, but that's not your responsibility. They're not, they're not doing the things that you need in order, in order for you to perform with your contract. Yeah. Iron Workman, All Nighter Hider, is Alaska worth the price of living up there? Uh, he was only up there visiting. Um, All Nighter Hider seems to me the way solar is sold, very expensive batteries are required. Uh, if not, it's like the home is just being used as an extension of the grid. Uh, Hider, dead on. It's an extension of the grid. They're not, they're not selling. They got off of selling that tactic because it didn't work. It didn't really work that well. It worked with a small percentage of society and it didn't work for anybody else. You really are an extension of the grid because when the sun's not out during night, unless you have the ability to store that power, you are going to be pulling off the grid, period and story. So it really is an extension of the grid. It was 100% not standalone unless we get into these high capacity batteries that you can then have a battery wall in your house like a Tesla wall. That's exactly right. Sam Farho. Matt, how do you access the lots when you buy a property? Uh, what are your lot preferences? How do you access the lots when you buy a property? What are your lot preferences? Uh, give me more detail on that, Sam. I don't have enough information there to, to answer what I know, what I think you want to answer. Hey, Ironwood, uh, Hydra to Ironwood. I'm only up there for June. Yep, in July, small fishing village. Yep, crazy expensive, but I'm not sure if that because we're a captive audience or it's always that way. Yeah, fair enough. Where's Phil? He's the one to ask that. Yeah, I agree. Where is Phil? Um, all nighter, uh, $13, two by four. Yeah. Yeah. When drafting to build two by four, ever, uh, ever foot of wall is standard to estimate and gets expensive real quick. Very expensive. Harry Hanover, uh, great boot camp last night. Thank you, Harry. I agree. You're an awesome part of the class. I'm excited to have all you guys. It's been a great class so far. Especially appreciated the step-by-step uh, -step marketing mechanics. Next step, practice, practice, practice. It's exactly right. We want to make sure to give you kind of the blocking and tackling. And then in execution, we teach you, show you what that execution should be. And then it's a matter of making it your own through your process. But then you just admitted, now you have a process. process, And that's what you need. You need to have process. You need to have the effective blocking and tackling taken care of. Because it doesn't matter how good of a quarterback you are, if you're constantly getting tackled because you don't have good process, and that process is that offensive line. Um, let's see. I'm a workman, all-nighter. I see like summer camp. Yeah, sounds fun. Yeah, I gave up on Alaska when I found out the price of living in Alaska, Montana, and West Virginia are just fine for me. Yeah, Montana's beautiful, too. Um, we really do have a beautiful country. Yeah. Um, Ironwood, uh, summer camp is the running joke up there. Yeah, true story. Uh, good morning, Ninja. Yes, yeah, good morning, sir. Uh, Mahid. Hi, Lumberjack. I talked to my manager of a small bank in my area to move my business from Chase to his bank. Oh, and what did they say? I love that story, Mahid. Tell me more. He offered me term loan, 15 years fixed to get some cash out for my free and clear rentals. Is that the type of loan you get from your bank? So that's awesome. Because guys, you saw it right there. I mean, he's not this massive land baron, but he went to a smaller bank. He's saying, I want to take it away from the big guys. What do you have for me? So I don't do 15s. I don't do 15s. But in your case, where you already own the asset free and clear, a 15 might work. It might be a lower rate. It might be um, something where on a 15, they'll still give you 80% loan to value ratios. Really, generally, from a concept perspective, I don't really care the term. 15, I like, I prefer 30s. I prefer 30s only because that gives me the most flexibility. However, if I already own an asset outright, I would look and see what the asset, what the what the uh, product, because that's what a mortgage is. I would look at what the product is that they're offering me. And then based on that, uh, based on that being the product, okay, what return does it get? However... You did it once, now you can do it again. Go talk to another small bank. And B, I just tell them. I just tell them flat out. Yeah, so I've worked with a couple of other local banks in the area. Uh, I want to take my business away from Chase. Uh, and based on that, I'm looking to see what programs and products you guys might have that would allow me to move some of my paid off assets or my, some of my portfolio over to you. Because if that relationship goes well, I would expect that I'd bring the entire bucket over of assets. Guys, they want your business. And they especially want business where they can say, hey, we won't go any higher than 
65% LTV or 60% LTV. That removes a ton of risk for them because on a normal home loan, they're on the hook. 70, 80, 90, 95%. That's why the process becomes so tenuous. When they're on there and you're giving them first position on a mortgage at 60%, they're like, damn, if he defaults, this is awesome. We just got a, we just got an asset at 60%. They look at it from a risk profile perspective. Love that you did that, Mahid. I do, like I said, usually 30s. I've done some 20s and I've done some 15s, but a majority of my stuff is 30. Yep. Look at my channel for the presentation that I did in building your own mortgage or building your own bank product. Look at that video and the slides I attached to it. You can get the slides right off of it. You should be looking at those slides and really understanding that that's a market product that was made. And you, you might be able to get them to copy it. I got the bank to copy the, the uh, 50, 40, 10. 50% debt to the lender, 40% seller carry, 10% down payment. I got the bank to do that. They had to tweak it a little bit because they have bylaws that say it can't be less than a 15% if they're going to carry the paper. But I got 50, 35, 15. So I can still get the seller to take 35% of the debt. That's sexier than sexy, guys. Um, let's see. In Japan, good morning. Matt, as you know, I have lots of rentals in Vegas. And so we are incorporating stripper poles in the living rooms. That's awesome. That's awesome. Is that business recession proof? I honestly don't know. I wonder if that business is recession proof. Yeah, might be. Uh, Josh Manfred, um, how were you able to spend that much time with Dion? I thought he napped most of the day. Uh, he napped in between. He did have to leave a couple of times to go take a nap and that was okay. I had work I had to go do because I'm not retired. Um, but he went and took a nap and then was refreshed and then we went and did something else. So we did multiple things on most days. It was a lot of fun. Um, agreed, Matt. If cabinet doors are needed, then a small wood shop is a good bet to fabricate them. Yeah, you just have to look at the price. You know, sometimes the prices on that stuff are insane. Um, I would work with, uh, the 80s were hard times in the housing biz. I was happy to give my friends a good deal on work. Yep, thank God they asked for a good deal. Yeah, I, I agree. Just saying, guys, it is about knowing the up times and the down times, 100%. That's why I'm going to get a, uh, a Lamborghini super cheap. That's why I'm going to get a two or three year old pickup that somebody paid $85,000 for. I'll probably get it for 45 grand. They're going to need to sell it. They're going to need to sell it. And I'm all about buying something for half price after it has, you know, 50,000 miles on it. I buy right. And that's one of the major things that we teach in the course, how to buy things the right way. And often planning is where you buy things the wrong way. When you didn't, when you, when you didn't plan properly, you get behind and then you have to figure out, Oh, how do I do this? You know, how, how do I get, I need that thing like right now. Well, we are better planners. And that's one of the things we talk about is plan, planning our projects in the course. When we do that, we're weeks ahead of it. So we can order that stuff. That's why that time with the doors I mentioned earlier, that was an outlier for us. Chat my ass, but that was an outlier for us and we fixed it. Um, ba, 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 da, ba, ba. Lars, um, Magid, you should be able to get 30 year, oh, Mahid, yeah, Mahid, yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, you should be able to get 30 year fixed loan uh, as a cash out refi unless credit changed uh, that much in the last six months. Um, I have been deployed. Lars, you are correct. We, I mean, every bank is not equal. I literally had a conversation with a, what was it, senior vice president of something or other had the conversation with them. And I just said, I said, guys, I would love to do business with you, but I can't. Your loan products suck. You guys are awesome. I like you a lot. I would love to work with you. But the product that you just gave me is a seven-year adjustable product. That's junk. And I said, I get if the bank's having an issue and they can't get into any fixed rate debt, I get that. But that gives me two reasons to not do a deal with you. I've got one that I love. I like working with you. I think you're great people to work with. You're efficient, you're effective, you get the work done. I see you around town. I want to do business with you. Can't. You don't have the products that I need. Or if you're off, if that's all you're offering, I don't love how I feel about your bank now. Maybe you're too overexposed to commercial real estate. They're not public. 
So maybe they are. Um, let's see, Mike, I want to see, uh, did you put your answer below here, Mike? Um, Mike, I need the answer on the uh, insulation thing. If you tell me, I can give you a better answer. Lars Nielsen's uh, Mahid. I would talk to two other local banks and a couple of credit unions as well. I wouldn't waste your time with the credit unions. They're not into investors. They're in, they're not into investors. They don't want to use investors. You know, you can go have a meeting with them, but usually you'll find you'll see pretty quickly they are risk averse and they do not want to do more than one mortgage with you, maybe two. Now, if they'll give you an amazing deal on that one mortgage, then yes. But if it's negligible, pass for me. James Wells, thanks for all you do. You're very welcome, James. I appreciate you coming and hanging out. Um, are you still seeing crazy prices in your market? Yes. Everything on the MLS in my market is negative cash flow. Yep. Look for off-market deals, but it's very difficult. Yes, 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 and yes. Um, here's what I can tell you. Um, single families have been that way forever where I am. So I look at different asset types. So I would do one of two things. I would start building the circles like Dion talks about. Um, where you just get further and further away from that center hub of where you want to be. That's the first thing I do. But the second thing that I do is asset classes. I'm looking at different asset classes. You know, people really need to understand it's a, it's a skinny market, but two, three, and four units in a lot of areas, it's a skinny market. Right now, I think there's four on market where I am, maybe five, maybe five. It's a skinny market. The five that are still there are all super overpriced. That's why they're still there. But when they start to time, Every one of those agents has been reached out to and said, I can appreciate that's what you're trying to get. Let me know if that's something that changes. I'd be, I'd be happy to at least have a conversation. Um, Angel R, how much do you normally pay to replace those electrical panels? It's embarrassing for me to say. Very little. Network is your net worth. This is what we teach in the class. Uh, I paid... For labor, materials, which includes the panel and the breakers, I was sub 500 a panel. Sub 500 a panel. And that's the best price you'll probably ever hear because of how I set up the work. Uh, Lars Nielsen. Uh, also, uh, Mahid, don't overlook hard money such as uh, Convoy as once, a great, uh, as once in a great while. Uh, they will have better rates and terms than banks, not often, but uh, once in a while. Lars is talking about exactly what's so critical, right? Shop, 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 shop. I love, that's one thing that Lars isn't going to learn from my course because he's already doing it. We talk about shopping it, shopping it, shopping it, shopping it. Dean and I joke all the time, right? He's always looking for the best, best deal at the party. So am I, but at a cost, right? I tell my bank, my bank knows I'm going to go out and shop. And if I find a better deal, I come to them and I say, here's a better deal. Can we get there? And if they say, no, we can't, and it's negligible, then I might still go with them because it's not a bunch of extra paperwork and all that junk that you have to create. Trying to get a loan with 137 units sucks. So there's a value to having those relationships. How much of a value? Is it a half a point on a mortgage? Nope. Is it an eighth of a point? But if it's an eighth and a point, usually in that phone call, I can get them to get there anyway, because there's margin there and there's what's called spread. And a lot of banks right now are at two and a half or 2.75 spread, what they can borrow against versus what they lend it, what they lend for. So if the difference is 275 and because I'm a great customer, I get them to two five, I can usually beat that other party out there just by getting a price comparison shop. And I don't burn my relationship because they recognize like, no, listen, I understand you might need to go somewhere else, but but we still have that kind of a relationship where it's a deep enough relationship and I give them enough business, you know, eight figures that, yeah, they're willing to at least have a conversation or heaven forbid, give me a discount because I don't pay retail. And that's where it's smart working with those guys. Uh, Joshua Coster, I was reading the Bigger Pockets house hacking book. They are saying 25 to 30K is what you need to start. Do you agree with that number in the current market? No, no, I don't. It depends on your market. In Gary, Indiana, you can buy a house 
for zero dollars down like Millennial Mike just did. Zip. Zip. So yeah, you don't. House hack, that's solely dependent on where you need to or want to live. That three and a half percent down of a million dollar home, yeah, that's 35K, you know? But if it's a $300,000 duplex, you probably don't need 30K. You probably don't. You can probably get away with 12 to 15. Um, and depending on your income, you can even ask for down payment assistance. No joke. Not kidding. So yeah, I don't, um, Bigger Pockets is an amazing brand, right? They do amazing things. The challenge is, is that what happens in some of the market cycles is some strategies come out and other strategies come in to replace those for the time being. Um, you know, seller financing or, or wraps, you know, that were done in the early 80s because no one was selling houses with 16% mortgage debt. So that's where a lot of, you know, creative financing, creative deals came along. Then as rates declined and continue to decline, well, then it gave way to, why do I need to do some creative product when I've got something from the bank there at 5%? Um, dividend Dave, there he is. Dave's here. I'm not starting over. Uh, Lars Nielsen, James, last month I bought a house off the MLS and it cash flows even after the PM fee. I just had to replace flooring um, in the basement and HVAC. Yep. Uh, James, uh, Lars's market is Delaware. Um, what is the formula for cap rate? Oh, I don't even look anymore. I don't even know it. I don't even know it. It's complex. Um, I can tell it to you guys because I have it here somewhere on my phone. But I only look at one thing, return on my capital. Cap rate doesn't include, so pi tie, right? So this was a concept, uh, you guys can look it up. You guys can Google cap rate. But pi tie is the thing that I'm most concerned about. I want principal, interest, taxes, insurance. And what's the E, pi tie? Expenses. Principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and expenses. And then once I figure out and understand that, then I can figure out, okay, I'm putting this much money into the deal. Here's what my monthly nut's going to be. Here's what my rate of return is going to be year one. And then I'm going to fine tune that, stabilize and then optimize. And then that rate of return is going to go up significantly year two, three, and four, almost always. And so I'm looking at pie tie, principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and expenses. Cap rate and the way they figure cap rate, I don't love it. And largely it's really a, it's really a commercial it's really a commercial concept because it's not a house hack thing. It's not even a small multifamily thing. It really is a commercial property aspect to it. In fact, you know what? I'll just do that. Um, so the cap rate meeting, and, and this, is, this is where it can, you know, this is how it's calculated, right? So, in order to calculate cap rate, an investor needs to be in possession of two data points. It's the asset's market value or asking price and the property's NOI, which is net operating income. A property's NOI is established by starting with the annual revenue and subtracting annual expenses related to operating and managing the asset before debt service. You guys buy a lot of stuff in cash? So to determine the cap rate, an investor will divide the property's NOI by the listing price of the asset as reflected in the graph. So basically, it's $100,000 is the NOI, purchase price is $2 million, that equals 0.05%, that's a five cap rate. Again, the key phrase here is expenses related to operating and managing the asset before debt service. If it's a five cap rate and you're not including debt service, why, why? Like on a massive commercial project, yep. But outside of that, no. So that's why for me in particular, that's why for me, I'm just not, I'm not a fan. I'm just not a fan of, not a fan of, uh, not a fan of cap rate. Not a fan of cap rate at all. I want to see I want to see principal interest, taxes, insurance, and expenses, expenses. So if I see my, my, serv my debt service plus insurance plus expenses, well, now I'm all in. Now I'm all in, right? And I know that they'll say, right? Some people will say, well, but 
um, they will have a, um, that's part, you know, that's, that's in the NOI. Eh, it's not usually, it's not usually, it's, it's outside of debt service. So that's, that's my feeling on it. Uh, and that's why I like my formula a lot better, essentially return on capital. I put X amount of dollars into the deal. And then this is my monthly pie tie. And then on top of my monthly pie tie, minus what I put in, then that's my, uh, that's my net, that's my true net operating income with everything considered, including debt service. And now I see what my returns are, my essentially my after expense cash on cash return or return on capital. That's the number that I, that's the number I work with. And that's my number that's almost always, like I said, it's in the 20s percent or higher. Um, bu, 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 bu. What do you think of paint that is guaranteed that you will need only one layer? I mean, I just use the same product. Benjamin Moore is what I always use. Benjamin Moore Regal Select. It's easy to clean. It's easy to paint. It gives us good coverage. So when I find a good product that works and it's relatively priced in the same range, I just stick with it because it's consistency and constantly changing something like paint will get expensive. Uh, I'm a workman, James Wallace. I see uh, and are just outside outside my range. Okay. I'm always finding good deals, but I do not want to pass them on, but I know nothing about Philadelphia. Got it. Is it too bad to paint walls and cabinets the same color like white? I don't paint my any of my walls white. All my stuff is painted exactly the same color, gray. Um, Sam, personally, I'm not a fan of single coat promising paint. Great if it works out, but as a contractor, I always count on two coats, pretty much. Um, let's get some lights. Excite the algo. Yeah, what the heck, guys? Dear heavens. Thank you, Hyder. Uh, Robert Farinelli. Yeah, no contact from seller's agent for a week. Needed leases for DTI, but signed a lease for uh, signed a lease for national property, so no longer needed that. But uh, need to sign FHA addendum. Yeah, they should be getting back to you. Like, I, so if I would talk to your, I would talk to your agent, and if they're not getting back to you, if you already have a signed contract, then I would call their managing broker. I people hate it when they do that. Just what, FYI, but I've done it. I've called the managing broker before. I'm like, yeah, I've been waiting for answers back. We sent them something every other day for the last week, and we've got nothing. That's a problem. That's a problem. Um, let's see. Oh, no messages that I had to take care of now. Sorry, how do you assess property lot and what are your lot preferences? I still don't understand. And, and give me in what context, Sam? Um, Lars, uh, Keith, cap rate is NOI divided by asset value. Yep, simple enough, but it doesn't usually include debt service. And that's the problem that I have with it. Robert Fernley basically stopped talking after they took my 10,000 earnest money. Uh, so much for wanting to close simple and quick. I know, right? Yeah, they say that a lot, but it just doesn't happen. There's Beth Traverso. We just classed the place up. Hey, Beth, good to see you, as always. Laura Samaniego, listen to you, and I didn't buy the extended warranty. It's all good, leaving HD now. Thanks so much for sharing your knowledge. My pleasure. Um, oh, man, skipped a bunch. There we go, better. Um, Sam Farho, do you use extension cords? Oh, super chat, Frank Contreras. Hi, Matt. Do you have any buildings that still have knob and tube? Have any issues insuring them? Yes. Uh, thanks. Yes, I do. And I rip out knob and tube as soon as we find it. Yep. There are a few companies that will still insure it and they are more expensive. So you will pay that premium. What you'll often see is the premium that you would pay to insure it is as expensive as it is to rip it out. And so what you talk to your insurance company about, here's what you do the way you do it. You actually go and get quotes, three quotes on replacing the knob and tube that's there. Get those three quotes. Then you talk to the insurance company and say, here are three quotes. Um, they're all licensed electricians. I'm going to do this project, um, but it's going to take 60 to 90 days to do the project. And then the insurance will say, you know what? We'll allow it so long as you do the project in 60 to 90 days, we will allow it. And if it's not done and we try and verify it, they'll typically drop you within 30 days. Then trying to get reinsured is a nightmare and expensive. So if you're using the same insurance company, you can, um, and they, you can tell them, I have a project, I'm going to be doing it. Uh, and that's usually how I do it. Uh, 
Robert Fanelli, by the way, shout out Landlord Odyssey for convincing me to buy this property. Awesome. Told me the told, told me about the property. Then we ran the numbers together. Much better deal than I than anything I'd seen in Match. Exactly. I love that. Congratulations. So that's an example, right? We have accountability groups within the Lumberjack Landlord Bootcamp. These guys meet separately. They don't need me. Sometimes I'm able to jump in and hang out, you know, during one of their sessions. Um, I think I've been once or twice, maybe in like six or eight weeks. Um, so when I'm free, I, I jump on. When I'm not, I don't. Um, but they have accountability groups. They ha- they help each other based on the premises and the, and the ideas that they learned in the course. So now there's accountability there. Now there's other people that speak your language. Now there's other people that are, you find the local people to you. Guys, this is, this is the dream of how we make this work, right? And how we get better as a community at doing what we do. Love it. Absolutely fantastic. Um, Frank and Cherish, generally I find you need two coats to get the true color. Yeah, usually that's a great. The secret to that is um, tinting your primer. So if you ever have to do a prime, a prime and then your color, you tint the primer. If it's just two coats of paint, like I said, I use Regal Select and have no issues. It goes really well. Um, Lars Nielsen, Matt, on VA loan, a bank could be financed at 101% as the fee can be financed into loan. That's true. Yep, absolutely. Yep, and I love that they do that for, for folks. But you can also get down payment assistance as well. And so VA was zero down no matter what. They go to 101% because they want to cover your closing stuff. So yeah, you can literally buy a property with a VA loan with pennies on the pennies. And that's the way it should be. You serve our country, you put your life on the line, you dedicate to doing a much lower paying job than what it would cut, what you would get in the free market. Yeah, I'm glad the government actually gets something right there and takes care of our veterans. So yeah, I'm happy for that. I'm glad you guys have access to a VA loan. That's something that shouldn't change. Um, Angel Art, with interest rates so high, do you think we'd be better off buying auction properties? Um, it, again, it's asset dependent. You know, um, if you can properly evaluate an auction properly, then a property, then yeah, auction property all day long. I've bought, I don't know, half a dozen of them. So I like auction properties. Um, you know why? Because I don't have to deal with people that don't know what they're doing because they're going to have to have a bank behind it. And if that thing's in bad shape, there's a lot of banks that won't finance uh, a, a property like that. Um, and so it really it really puts the know-how guys um, and the people that know what they're doing, it really puts them ahead of the game. Yeah. Um, All Nighter, anyone looking at property auctions? Yep. I would recommend going and seeing the uh, operation and also who the regular sharks are that go there all the time. So there's the store, there's the, there's the courthouse steps properties. And then there's also once they've a lot of times passed that step, then they're on to, you know, one of the different websites, uh, auction.com or zone or um, hub zoo. Um, I've bought from all of those guys. I bought from all of them. I bought good assets from all of them. Um, Angel R, I'm used to seeing 16 to 17% return for my portfolio, but we, when interest rates are so high, I'm now only seeing 10. And that's if your offer gets accepted. Totally agree with you. And that's what you see is that, you know, it might be time to look at other assets too. You might want to look at other asset types, duplexes, tries, quads, because they're, you're likely going to see the returns that you would want versus the lower returns on single family houses. Millennium Mike, hard money is trash. Private money is where it's at. Yes, but always explore both. You'll likely find that private money is less expensive and easier to work with. Uh, What is down payment assistance? So down payment assistance is there are actual programs out there where you can apply um, to the government for down payment assistance to buy a home. There are those programs out there. Um, And they will cap it. It's based on your income. It's based on the price of the house. It's based on a bunch of stuff. But there, you can Google down payment, uh, housing down payment, assi- you know, uh, housing down payment assistance programs, and you'll find some. The rules are pretty strict, as they should be, uh, but you will find that there are people that do qualify. I think one of the big criteria, though, is it being a uh, a residence. It's, it can't be an investment property, but if you're house hacking, that qualifies. And they will do it on duplexes. I haven't seen it on threes and fours, but I have seen it on duplexes. 
Uh, Jesse Mao, good to have you. Good morning, Lumberjack. Thank you for your course. Awesome. I'm getting so much value just starting to go through the course. Love that. Thank you for the feedback. That's what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do, try and create great value for you guys. Um, this is good info right here, guys. Real world. Appreciate that, Ironwood. Yes, sir. That's the only way we do it. Um, I always run and walk when listening to Matt. <laughs> I should have the biggest group of skinny, in shape people ever. Um, Keith Hager, great explanation on cap rate. Welcome. Good. Uh, occupancy rate, formula, total doors, 100%, 20 units less, two, two vacancy. Uh, yes. Yes. Oc uh, Keith Hager, occupancy rate formula. Yep. Yep. Exactly right. That's how you figure for a vacancy rate. You are correct. Um, all nighter. I was just going to type uh, about tinting the primer. Yep. I've never been charged a fee for that either. No, they don't. They don't charge for it. That's the key. Tint that primer, guys. When you're doing a darker color, you tint the primer and it will make, it will cover in with a, with a real quality paint. You can get the real color out of it, usually in a coat. Not always, but usually. Um, SK, no response from buying language than multiple attempts. Best way to reach them, alternate options you advise. <clears throat> um, did you, if you, um, I don't know if he, uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I know he's super busy. Um, I I think my call with him is like a month from now. I don't know if he's still taking new clients. I would just ask that when you call. Ask when you call if he's still taking new clients. Because what I really like about Bob is that, I mean, aside from everything else I like about Bob, one of the things I really like about Bob is that he really makes sure his customers are taken care of before he expands to more customers. Um, and so... Yeah, that's the only, sorry, I, I wish I had better advice for you there, but I think that uh, um, ask if he, at, when you next time you call and ask, ask if he's taking new clients. Because what I, what we shouldn't do, right, is every single person that calls into Bob needing essentially free advice. You know, one of the things that you could do is say, I'm strongly considering you. I'd like to give you, I'd like to pay you to go through my previous tax return and see what differences and what things you might've done differently. Might cost you a few hundred bucks, but now you know if you found stuff that should have been done differently. Just an idea. I did that with somebody and then I didn't hire them. Yeah, I did. Uh, Brock Boudreaux. Hey, Brock. Hey, Matt, quick question. Do you keep track of your appliances in your units for maintenance? Yes, I do. Like brand serial numbers, et cetera, for like fridges, HVAC furnaces, et cetera? Yes, I do. It's called documenting your unit. It's how we structure it in each of the units. Now, the documenting your unit is a newer trend for us in just the last couple of years. So we don't have every single unit documented, but we have a lot of them documented. Yep, we have a lot of them documented. But yeah, fridges, HVAC furnaces, when stuff was replaced, absolutely. Um, so yeah, yep. James Welsh, if you are buying a six-unit building, are you always going for a 30-year DCR loan first? Nope. Or are you okay with a 710 arm for a commercial building? Thanks, James, that's a great question. So the way that almost all commercial loan debt goes is it's three, it's usually three, five, seven, or 10-year debt amortized over 25, not 30. A DSCR loan is usually amortized over a 30-year period. Um, and so when I buy commercial properties, I will look at a DSCR loan, but often the DSCRs are in the nines and I can get my bank to do one in the low sevens. So if I can get my bank to do one in low sevens and DSCR is in the nines, I'd rather take the deal with my bank, even though it's an amortization over 25 years, I can usually get, um, you know, seven year debt is usually what I'm focused on because in seven years in any seven year period over history, you can see a pretty big, you know, shift, even in the early eighties, when it went from like nine or 10 up to 16 and then back down to 10, that took like eight years, but eight years to fully correct. So from that perspective, right? So we started last year, middle of the year at like fours and then rose quickly. And now we're in the sevens, maybe go to eight, maybe go to nine, depending on the loan product. Um, but when we hit recession, when something, when some market issue happens, hopefully not, but a war. But if you start to look at that stuff, 
you because you're going up on the curve, it's not, hey, I know you can refinance in two years, or hey, I know you can refinance in four. It's none of those things. What it is is likelihood. Likelihood. Study history. Look at history. Mike, one rental at a time, 53-year spreadsheet. We were talking about that. And then he was like, yeah, I'm just going to put in the work and do it. I was like, awesome. I wasn't going to do it. You know? So, but when you look at that, it's like, but I lived through three cycles. You know, I lived through the 2000s. I lived through 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then now and again now. And so having that market experience, it goes like this, you know, and, and you see those, you know, the peak and then it starts to trough down. And then, you know, waiting until you start to see that goose activity, and then you start to see it tick up. Um, but that's where I would say for me, the DSCR loan is if I believe that I'm never going to get better paper debt than that. It's possible, you know, but I want a little bit of fun because I can always get out of the DSCR loan. The problem with the DSCR loan is that I will have paid seven years at 9% instead of having paid seven years at seven and a quarter. 1.75%, calculate the difference, the gap, right? Uh, because DSCR, what are they doing? They're selling that loan to an insurance company because that insurance company wants to a way to guarantee five, six, 7% on the money that they have sitting in their coffers, right? And that's who, that's who buys these buckets, right? And so DSCR, I've seen some rates, high nines, low tens. Well, that's because the insurance company is buying them for eight or seven. And so the DSCR vendor to service the loan, they're getting that, they're getting that margin gap. That's how really how the business works. Uh, let me know, James, if that answered the question. SK, accumulating down payment for the next purchase is a challenge after buying multiple properties in the last three years. Do you recommend getting personal loan from bank for down payment or alternate methods? I don't recommend, I mean, it, it depends on how aggressive that you want to be. I think what you start looking at is you put together a beautiful presentation about the existing assets that you have where you got them, how you got them, the way you got them, and then showing people that you have a business. Most people don't want to invest, banks don't want to invest in real estate businesses because they know that a majority of the, of, that still gives them, that's still housing exposure. So what you want to do is, is you actually want to find, you know, you actually want to find other investors that say, like, um, there's a bunch of them that, you, you know, you'll see on Instagram that follow me or on Facebook that follow me, there's a bunch of personal lenders out there that will do 200,000, 300,000, 500,000, but what do they wanna see? They wanna see what you buy, they wanna see what you buy it at, they wanna see how good of a job you do turning it around um, and then building your business. The biggest mistake that people made in SK, this isn't to pick on you, so hopefully you don't take it this way. The biggest mistake people make is thinking that the best and most important thing is buying the next asset. It's not, it's not. In my course, we teach the exact opposite. The most important thing after acquisition, stabilization and optimization. Answer the question or think of the question this way. When I go to present to a bank and there's other investors going to present to these same banks and there's a limited pool of money, right? It's not unlimited, it's limited. When they say, walk me through the last three projects and I walk them through the last three projects and then I show them the returns, right? And my returns are 21, 27, and 32%. 21, 27, 32%. 21, 27, 32%. Is the guy that's going to present behind me anywhere near that? Nope. So who are they more likely to decline? They're human nature. They're more likely to decline that guy because he might have 6, 9, 13%. My worst deal is twice as good as his best. So... When you're becoming an operator, the idea isn't buy the next asset, buy the next asset, buy the next asset, buy the next asset. The most important thing is stabilize and then optimize. Acquisition, stabilize, optimize. If you stabilize the asset where now you have good renters in there, now you've got steady stream of income, now you can improve the asset, then improve that asset. That actually helps you give upward pricing pressures to rents. That then increases your return because you have 30-year fixed rate debt on the asset. Your returns start to increase. Your margins start to increase. What are you showing the bank? You're showing the bank that you actually know how to grow a business. That's what you're showing them. When I show them year one, it was 12, but by year three, I was 23 or 24. I doubled my return on my capital or my rate of return. My margins went from, they doubled, they were over 100% better 
or almost 100% better, you're showing the bank that you're an operator. And that's what banks, that's, that's who banks want to lend to. Because do you know what happens with operators in bad economies? They find a way to survive. They find a way to survive. So I'm not always looking for the next asset to buy. I'm always looking for my best use of capital, my buck, my buck method, easy for me to say, buck method, best use of capital. If I'm putting $10,000 into a unit, what kind of return is that going to get me? Am I better off buying the next asset? People get too enamored, again, not at USK, generally speaking. People get too enamored with buying the next one, buying the next one, buying the next one. I have people tell me all the time, I'm a really good buyer. No, you're not. You might be, you might think you are, but everybody thinks they're a good buyer. They're buying the deal. It's good enough for them to buy. The best operators are the ones who end up wealthy. The best operators, not the best buyers, the best operators. Because you can be buying great deals, but if you don't know how to squeeze every last dime out of that asset, you're not nearly, the, the buyer is never going to be as good as the operator. That's the issue. I know lots of people that buy a lot of stuff and they're still like, I just don't know where all the money goes. It's because you're not being an operator. Operators do know. And they're measuring their returns. And what do you think a bank cares the most about when you go to talk to them? They care what your returns are. That's what they want to know. They want to know and show that you know how to run the business. And that's what operators do. SK received a violation notice from city code department to fix fridge and wall hole in a month. Okay. Does that mean the tenant reported? Yep. That's exactly what it means. It was not reported by the tenant earlier to my property manager. Best way to tackle. Yeah. Your, your, your tenant's a dick. Are they behind on rent? If they're not, they might be coming to be behind on rent. The reason I say they're a dick is not because they didn't report it. It's who they reported it to. If they've reported it to the to that person three or four times, what I would do in all honesty, I would reach out to the tenant and say, hey, I've gotten this notice from the city. I just want to make sure you heard from me, the owner, that we're going to take care of that for you. I'm curious, did you request this of property management before this? You might have just found out that you have a bad property manager. That's, that's how it happens. Maybe they reported to the property manager. Maybe they weren't a dick. Maybe they reported to the manager three or four times and it still hasn't been fixed in a month or two months. Well, in that case, guess what? Yeah, I'm going to call code. I'll call code enforcement. I work so much with code enforcement on my area because of the emergency rental assistance program tenants we went through. And every time something didn't get fixed within a day, it was them calling code enforcement. That's a problem. So. When we go through that process, right, um, I always told the, I said, when they would call me and say, hey, so we have an issue. I said, okay, great. What's the issue? They're like, I always would say, let me guess. They're like, okay. And so I would give them a name. I wouldn't give them an address. I'd give them a name. And they're like, yeah, how'd you know? She's behind on rent. And then it light dawns on it for them. Oh, yep. Yep. So yeah, I know who it is. Yeah, did she tell you what the issues were? No. What are the issues? What are the issues she's making up? And then it's like, it, look, I have the I had the report from two years ago when she moved in. It like it was like that when she moved in. Now it's an issue. My lease says if you move in, you have five days to report any deficiencies in the apartment for us to, in order for us to cover them. Otherwise, it's on you. There you go. That's how I do it. So what I would do is, is I would talk to the tenant first, understand if they reported to the property manager. If they did, then I call the property manager and say, but I would have them report, show me proof, text message, uh, you know, snapshot of a phone call when they, when they did the phone call um, or an email, right? Uh, and I would just say, I assure you, it will be taken care of. Um, I appreciate you letting us know. That's it. And then make sure the property manager gets on it, fixes it, takes pictures, Sends them to you and CCs the city on that work being done and then setting up an inspection for them to come out and look at it if they need to. That's how I would handle that. Again, I'll teach that in the course. Sam Firehole, lot or land where the property is built on? Um, lot or land where the property is built on? Um, I don't use extension cords. I was just looking for the rest of the question. I don't use extension cords for anything except for maybe a sump pump. And it would be a 
10 gauge pump, you know, it's 10, 10 gauge line. So it'd probably be, it'd be properly rated if you might have draw that it's going to have. Sorry, how do you assess property lot? What are your lot preferences? I don't buy, I don't buy raw land. I don't buy raw land. Um, so I don't assess property necessarily. Um, I don't buy raw land. Um, how long do permits usually take? It depends. Depends on how big the scope of the project is. Um, permits and depends on how busy the, 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 that division is. Usually for me, permits on a rehab are three months. Um, excuse me. Start to finish the project is three months. It's usually three week, two to three weeks before I get the project back. But they're fine with letting you demo. You just can't close up any walls. So when we work with one of the cities that we work with, I always tell them, I fill out the permit. There's everything that I see, but there's some other stuff that I want to take a look at. You know, so I don't know if we're going to need to upgrade electrical. I don't know if we're going to need to upgrade plumbing. So I just want to at least pull a demo permit. Pull out the paperwork, do the demo permit. That lets me demo, assess what we need to do, then get quotes from uh, other uh, electricians and plumbers and things like that. Then they do that work. Um, and then I have the rest of the information that I need to fill out the permit. And then from submitting the next permit, it's still usually about three weeks. That doesn't mean that I can't start that work until then. In most municipalities, it means you can. It just means you can't close it up. So when you do it, you do demo. But then the next thing is assessment. After assessment is quoting electrician, plumber, whatever is being done based on you having gutted the gutted the asset or the other property. Um, and then I'm selecting that vendor and then giving them the work and doing the contract. All of that stuff is outside the permit. But before I do insulation. I'm getting the rough electrical and rough um, rough plumbing inspected. Then that passes or fails, and then you make adjustments as needed. Then you do insulation, then that passes. Then you do sheetrock, and that passes. After that passes, and then you do finish electrical, finish plumbing, uh, and those are the last steps that they do there. And then you're done. That's usually the process. Uh, we cover a lot of that stuff in our in, in the course. Uh, I would work with Matt. Do you keep all your own books, accounting, or do you get help from someone's software? Software, yes. We use DoorLoop. I like DoorLoop. It's very easy for my agents to use um, when we send somebody to go out and show a property. Uh, it's easy for my tenants to use to file an issue or to report an issue. It's also very easy for me to put together an online app that they can fill out when they're doing their properties. They can literally fill it out right there on their phone. So yeah, that's a big win. So yeah, door loop is what we use. Uh, all nighter hider efficiency of the asset is the name of the game. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, very often, you know, you are going to get less when you sell it if the asset's not dialed in. And so that's what I'm trying to do. You're either in one of two camps in my eyes, though. You're either a premium turnkey asset, or you're not. Because for me to gut a B level or a C level rehab, for me to gut that versus a D or the place is destroyed, cost me exactly the same, but the asset costs me more. Well, if I still have to gut the thing, what do I care? I want to buy the lowest piece of crap garbage I can buy because I still have to demo it. I still have to make repairs. I still have to, I still have to, I still have to. And if I got to do all that, then the last thing I want to be doing is paying some value for as it sits. I don't want to pay any of that. Not interested. All right, six minutes left, guys. Six minutes left. But I'm going to go upstairs and enjoy the rest of my Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Took the kids out to breakfast this morning. It was fun. We always do breakfast on Sundays. It's a good time. Good time. Oh, sorry for the young. Two and a half hours last night and then another two hours this morning. So four and a half hours. It's a lot of talking. SK, after acquisition, how many months do you recommend for stabilization and months for optimization before it's uh, an autopilot? That's a great question. Um, it really depends on the asset because how much do I have to do there, right? The stabilization is the tenants in there, they're paying rent. I've gotten through their list of the things that need to be taken care of. Now I'm starting to look at the things that I can take care of. Optimization is how do I dial in the property and get my best use, right? Or my best return? Well, that comes from, you know, uh, the electric light package I talked about. It's less than a thousand bucks. How is that optimizing? It's going to cut the electric bill a little bit for them, but it's going to give it a brand new fresh look. So that with some paint, it's doing some of those things when you have that existing tenant there, 
because you're getting ready for the next version of that tenant, maybe that same tenant or a new tenant. But you want to be doing some of that stuff while the tenant's in there and then you're getting it stabilized. Then when you go to market, there's a couple of other fine-tuned things that you might do. But those other fine-tuned things you might do, now the thing is ready to go to market and you're ready to get a big rent bump. Big, huge, awesome. So we'll spend five to 10,000 bucks on a unit. But what does that mean we're going to get for a return in 60 to 90 days? We did it with a unit we were getting paid a little over a thousand bucks a month on. And we spent about 10 grand on the unit. We did a kitchen, we did a bathroom, we upgraded some of the electrical stuff, we did flooring. When it was all said and done, we were about 10 grand. But the rent went from 1,000 or 1,025 to 1,700, $700 a month, 700. But here's what the bank sees. The bank sees that you knew how to buy an asset, you had to buy an undervalued asset, you knew how to then what work to be done on a budget to then get a much higher return on that asset. So I go from a thousand to 1700 and you say, this is the process. That's why banks love me. This is the process that we've really perfected is we are really good at buying undervalued assets, doing the appropriate corrections while the tenant is there, then binder strategy them or even just giving them a, an outright rent increase, depending on what we want the end result to be. Um, and then if they stay, great, we're going to do some of these other fine tuning things, maybe the roof while they're there and do that sort of stuff. And then when they do finally leave, now you're going and doing the next thing, the big stuff, right? Maybe a kitchen, maybe some flooring that you don't have to do while they're there, doing some of those types of things. And now that thing is going to pop if they're just like, yeah, I'm paying too much, blah, 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 blah. One of the concepts of the binder is that's great is it's a double-edged sword. One is, yeah, we'll stay, but man, it sucks I'm paying more rent. So some people can literally get bitter about that. And then they're just like, but then, but it's because they look around and they're like, yeah, it's fine, screw it. But then others get this like entitled attitude where it's like, well, I'm paying so much more rent, I want you to fix everything now. And not fix, but upgrade everything now. They think fix... I literally had somebody say, well, I want a new kitchen. Yeah, good luck. Ain't happening. So that's how it works. Um, I would work with Matt. Have you ever built anything from the ground up? No. In Montana, we build a lot of new stuff. Yep. Reason, a lot of land and very little used stuff on the market. Yep, absolutely. Well, that's when you have that um, uh, population explosion. When you have that growth, and there were a lot of people that moved to the beautiful state of Montana. When you, uh, in fact, I have clients there in Billings. See, I know cities in Montana. But yeah, I have clients in Billings. And so um, now I'm embarrassed. I think Billings is in Montana. <laughs> we have a lot of clients. Um, so yeah, so uh, ground up, absolutely. The key is, is going to be understanding how can you do, you know, usable projects at scale if you're like getting into being a builder in that sort of area. SK, do you always recommend touch-up paint, yard cleanup, and re-key when the new tenant moves out or moves in? Um, I recommend digital locks because then I don't have to re-key. That's a money saver right there. I'm not doing locks every single time somebody moves in or moves out. So I change it to a digital lock. I don't give them a key. I give them a passcode, first thing. Um, always recommend touch-up paint. Yes, I want to fill the walls appropriately and then recut the walls and make it a pretty paint job. Yes. Um, yard cleanup? Yes. Uh, how much do you recommend the budget for stabilization be per single family home? It varies it, because some, some, uh, I recommend doing the things the tenant knows are an issue because your job as a landlord is A, to take care of issues, but B, to reduce the amount of drag by which every asset in your portfolio. If you have 10 properties that are calling you six times a year, that's 60 calls that you have to answer. If I do a bunch of those projects, if I do 30, 30 things or 40 things or, or things that knock out 30 or 40 of those phone calls. Well, now without adding any capacity on the other side, I can double the number of units and have the same amount of phone calls. That's the key. It's proper management of time and resources. That's again, something we talk about in the course. Josh Manfred, Matt, well, when you are documenting the units, are you keeping that info in a Google sheet or another program? Keeping it in my property management system. Yep. And we can, we export it every once in a while, you know, just, but we also have backups. We have their software, they have backups, we have backups. Um, but yeah, 
Yep, I'm keeping that data. Matt, you picked the biggest city in Montana. Oh, well, see, I know Montana. I don't know many cities outside of Billings, though. <laughs> um, what is it? Uh, there was another one. I, I may have to look it up though, where it was. But yeah, Billings, Montana. I know it's a huge city, right? Um, let's see. Missoula. I, I knew that was another one. Yeah, Missoula. Yep. And Bozeman and Butte and Helena. Kalispell, I've, I've not been to. Anaconda. Man. Yeah, so it's Billings, Missoula, Great Falls, Bozeman, Butte, Helena, Kalispell. Yeah, Belgrade, they start to get small. Belgrade, Havre, Anaconda, Miles City, Whitefish, Livingston. Laurel, Sydney, Lewiston, Columbia Falls, Big Fork, Polson, Glendive, Glen, Glendive, Dillon, Big Sky. Yeah, Big Sky, Montana. That's right. Yeah. Yep. A lot of lodges, Red Lodge, Wolf Lodge, some that's other stuff. Yeah. Cool. Guys, you have an absolutely fantastic week. It's a blast as always spending time with you, hanging out. I hope you guys have a fantastic week. Um, Look at the syllabus. Look at the syllabus. If if you think you know everything on there, then my course isn't for you, unless you think I might be able to do it better. Uh, Great Falls has everything. Yeah, I think we'll go next. I agree. All right, last question. Uh, Matt, thanks for the response about DSCR and ARMS. I am a student of Zuber and know he loves 30-year debt, so I wasn't sure if you were doing the same as him, okay with the seven-year debt. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the asset. I recognize that over a seven to 10-year period that there's likely going to be change in the market. And so if the number works, though, at seven, I'm not doing a bad deal. But if the number works at seven, I believe in a seven to 10 year period, I believe you're going to be able to refinance debt. Look at history. Look at history, seven to 10, right? Look at history, seven to 10 years. Look at the history of stuff. You know, history is not always the same, but it often rhymes. And so do I want that being a lion's share of my portfolio? No, I don't. But the reason that Zub actually got out of a bunch of his um, his uh, debt, his uh, variable rate debt, arms, his variable rate debt, the reason he got out of a lot of that stuff was because he was able to get DSCR debt at 4%. Well, DSCR debt now is 10%, right? The spread's a whole lot bigger. DSCR for a long time was trading right around where the market was trading for investment property. Now, investment property is a two to 200 or 225 to 275 basis point spread. And DSCR is a 400 spread, 400 in a lot of cases. Just something to keep in mind. Uh, thank you so much and everyone for participating. Yes, thank you, Hire. I hope you guys have a fantastic day. As I always say, we try and create great content for you. Please make sure you check out the syllabus. I really implore you guys, if you want to become elite in investing in a great operator, like I talked about at the top of the show, that's how you do it. I've done it. Been there, done that. Got the t-shirt right here. Anyway, hope you guys have a fantastic week. Please make sure on your way out, you hit that like button and we will see you in the next one. Thanks everybody.